All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Bicasa. This week, we've got John Childress on the line. John is a friend of mine. Actually, we met through LinkedIn years ago, uh, collaborating on fly fishing. We had some questions for each other and ended up becoming good friends and actually wrote a book together called Fly Fishing for Leadership. So you should certainly check that out. And I'll let John maybe explain a little bit more on that. However, John is from the UK. He's out of the London proper area. Um, you originally started as a marine biologist, graduated from Harvard University. Uh, you got into business consulting. But on top of all of that, from a professional aspect, you've been a core angler for a long time. In fact, I've heard of some of your amazing trips to Jurassic Park, uh, the jungle, to other areas in the United States, overseas, etc. So you're, you're just a plethora of information when it comes to fly fishing, and I've always loved that and respected that of you. But I think today, what I would really like to do is dive into your most recent trip, which was down into South America, it was Amazon jungle fishing, which is ultra unique. If you haven't been to the Amazon, um, I highly recommend making that trip in your lifetime. I plan on making a trip in my lifetime. It is a floodplain, which people most don't understand. And that's how the fish feed on that. So we'll have John talk to us a little bit about that and what he's done down there. And then the last bit of the show today, we're going to dive into uh, John's tip. And that's a really cool one for us. It's all about travel rods. And it's often a misunderstood space. Um, and it's a uh, space that is, um, it goes both ways, I would say. Right, John? Um, some people really love it. Some people really hate it. So it's a great subject for us to touch on and get some some information on. So, John, Thanks so much for joining the show. I'd love for you to kick us off today with a little bit about some of the books that you've recently created and have in the past. And then uh, tell us a little bit about, I know you're putting together a program for, for fly fishing as well that's um, up in Bristol Bay. Absolutely, Christian. And thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> it's great to be on this podcast. I've heard several sev several of your podcasts and been inspired so it's good to hopefully we can do the same uh yeah, a bit yeah about for my sure. background i started out as a marine biologist and then somehow i got seduced to the dark side of business <laughs> <laughs> and i founded a consulting firm and actually it was interesting when you look at marine biology or anything in the biological world everything's connected it's an ecosystem mm -hmm. Yep. And when you start looking at a business, it really is an ecosystem as well. And so I worked in the space of senior management leadership. How does the leadership team impact the entire organization? Wound up writing three or four books about that. And then when you, and then my passion for fly fishing started really kicking in. And you and I collaborated on a book called Fly Fishing for Leadership, which is basically mm -hmm how the principles of fly fishing and the principles of leadership just match almost perfectly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we interviewed something like 75 guides, lodge owners, people in the fly fishing industry, uh, personalities. Like I got to meet Jack Hemingway, which was mm. yep. Ernest Hemingway's son on a fishing trip. And he taught me a lot about courage. Mm -hmm. Leaders have to have courage. I think in fly fishing, you have to have that that optimistic courage as well. Yeah, exactly. So and we did um, a lot of uh, executives yep. too that were they were executives in businesses that fly we did. fished, and that was we really did. Cool. We talked to a number of those, and you know, it's remarkable when we started our conversation. Uh, tell me what fly fishing has taught you about leadership. They would pause for a minute, scratch their head, and say. You know, I never thought about it, but mm -hmm. and then came these great analogies on slowing down your cast, slowing down your decision making so you can make better decisions. The foundation problem solving, right. problem problem solving, solving. the gotcha. foundation of, of fly fishing is the cast. The foundation of fly fishing is people skills. And they just went on and on. And the guides really got it. Mm -hmm. going about what it takes to lead in terms of helping the client mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than take over 
and do what they want to do, really listening to the client's needs mm -hmm. and then leading in them to have that full experience. So it was <laughs> great. I mean, I think we got a good book out of it. Yeah, I, th I think so too. I've, what I've always liked about it was when we started uh, marketing the book, people would say, well, I'm not a fly fisherman. And I would go, but have you fished in your life? And they would say, you know, I have. And I said, well, here, read this story or try that. And they'd be like, oh, I just never thought of it that way. This is really cool. I really enjoyed it. I don't know anything about fly fishing, but I know fly fi I know fishing, right? Yep. And uh, it had an attraction for people. So it was kind of cool. But you, you've done quite a few other books. Um, you've also continued in your career with some leadership programs. Uh, tell us a little bit about those two things as well. Well, I think... Um... As I said in the beginning, Christian, uh, if you look at a business as an ecosystem, then everything is connected. So if you don't like what's happening down on the shop floor, you got to look backwards and look up, up the chain mm -hmm. of connections. And so we started working with senior management teams. And I remember in 1980, a year after the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, mm -hmm. I was asked to come in and help the senior management team build a safety culture. And I don't know anything about nuclear power. Right. <laughs> but what I did know is that if you look at that ecosystem inside that nuclear plant, there's a lot of connections that were broken. Mm -hmm. and mainly it was on the communication, trust, and respect levels. The nuclear engineers who were PhDs didn't didn't respect the engineers who were just monkey wrenchers. And there was just a lot of lack of communication that opened the floodgates for some very poor decisions that led to an accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so well, what I'm most proud of is that after we spent a couple of years there helping them build a, a safety culture, which is openness, speak up, all those kinds of issues that work well, no matter where you are. Mm-hmm. They ran the mo they ran the safest nuclear plant for 24 years before it was finally decommissioned. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's there's a value in working with leadership and helping them understand that organizations are shadows of their leaders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a cool cool story. And that Three Mile Alley story, gosh, if you haven't even just read some articles around that. It's really unique. It's uh, how it all occurred and came down through. It's uh, it's definitely worth a read. And uh, I'll give you a tidbit of information here too, John. So I was talking to my mother the other day. She's, you know, 80 years old. And uh, she said to <laughs> me, old what do you, yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing here and there? And I saw a meeting with the guy, you know, I wrote that book with mom. Is this member John? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I says, you know, he was, involved in the three mile island thing in consulting she goes oh no way he probably knows rick and i said what well rick <laughs> minch was my my neighbor as a son uh -huh. when i was her son as a kid and um he was one of the first engineer uh group respondents to that as well so i thought that was pretty funny kind of small world how things come together so you know let me ask you one question on these books yeah. real quick um <clears throat> where, where did your love for writing come? I mean, you don't, most people don't <laughs> get up and, and write four or five books in their lifetime, but you, you have, and, and where did that, where did that come from? Well, I've written nine, actually. Nine. Uh, yeah. I think my mother, my mother was an English teacher, mm -hmm. number one, and she would always tell us stories about great leaders, great writers. Great thing. So I think it just sort of got to me that stories are powerful. Yeah. We remember stories. We don't remember facts, but we do remember stories that made us feel. And I think that's mm -hmm. what great writers do. And the trick to that is to how do you bring that into a business book? Well, yeah. you tell examples and you tell the human story behind the business story. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and fly fishing is so much like that, right? Every time you go out, you come back with micro stories. You have oh, that you story back of with... the cast that you made, the story that the, the catch that you made, the story that the stumble you made uh, on the way in, or the <laughs> how you lost that, that had how your you parking lost spot, that. or how the lost how you the lost monster, that right? Fish. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But it is it's a, a it's a long sign um, 
for all of us, right? You know, that, that story is so powerful. So, you know, well, you passing know, it on to your friends and, and, and uh, whatnot is really important. I think that there's a part of our book in which one of the issues we talk about is there are probably th several hundred books on golf and there's mm -hmm. several thousand books on fly fishing. It's just right. It's just more of a thoughtful person's pursuit. And you can learn so much if you just slow down and think about what's going on around you, what's going on under the surface is how you fish, and what's going on with your buddies that you fish with. I mean, it's just, it's a learning experience. That's the best way I can say it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, it's, it's like a layered cake. There's just, there's more than you can imagine, right? And each one. Healing the onion. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let's, let's dive into um, the Amazon jungle space. Let's talk some fishing because I know you love that. I do. In fact, I'm going back in March after my knee gets healed. Uh, okay. I've been there about, I've been to the Amazon about five times now. And I had a really powerful experience the last time I went, which was to Brazil. I had been the same place t 10 years before and flying over, it was absolutely pristine jungle the first time. Flying over mm. into the lodge area the second time was filled with scars of, uh, deforestation, logging, burning the forest. There were forest fires everywhere. It just looked like, it looked like Hiroshima almost. I mean, I was just appalled mm. at the, at the devastation that's going on. And why that's important for us who fish is that when that, when that vegetation is taken away and the rains come and the, the silt washes into the river and it silts up the river and this, it damages the spawning. It damages the migratory fish that come up. Uh, mm -hmm. It affects the whole ecosystem, but particularly for us who are fishing. I was talking with the owner of the lodge. He actually owns, owns a few of the lodges. And he said, you know, John, in 10 years, this will all be gone. And I thought, holy shit, mm. that can't happen. I just can't. So I'm trying to mobilize fly fishermen to realize that we really need to take a stand on the environment, not only our local environment where we fish, which is important, but something like the Amazon, which controls a lot of the weather patterns across the globe. Uh -huh. Excessive uh -huh. rains, excessive droughts, all that is happening because of the, the disruption in the weather patterns of the... But that aside, there is some great fishing, Christian. <laughs> I saw some of the photos. Absolutely yeah, great fishing. It looks incredible. Uh, one of the most interesting species I caught. This trip, I went to a place called Kenjam, which is in the south of Brazil. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not a muddy tropical river like you think of. It's a gin clear river mm -hmm. because it flows over granite. So it's sight fishing, which is mm -hmm. like we do back yeah. home. So it's got a lot of those peculiarities, except there were seven, seven sports species that we could catch in one area, which yep. to me is a remarkable experience. They caught wolf fish, which looked like a pre right. prehistoric snake on the bottom of the waiting for something to swim yeah. by and it attacks it and they're right. huge they're like they a jump hyper they... hyper looking aggressive catfish oh almost it, it's, yeah they're amazing it, it's a scaly looking prehistoric catfish is what i would say yeah yeah and exactly they, and they grow big and they're ferocious on the fly and then uh -huh. there's the tiger uh, i mean the uh, the golden dorado and peacock bass and Paku, which is a Paku, huge, right? big round yep. fish, which is a cousin of the piranha. What's interesting about the Paku is they eat fruit and flowers. Mm -hmm. 
So they're not necessarily a predatory fish in that sense. So you cast a fly that looks like a piece of fruit, a cherry. Yeah, like a berry, right? If I remember. Like, like, like a big berry, berry that would fall down from a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it has to plop. So you got to get your cast so it plops so that it stimulates them. So they come up to the surface and grab it. That's just. And is your cast, is it a high, do you stop at a higher angle to kind of get that to shoot down into the water? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. You kind of stop it and allow it to just drop. Okay. Yeah. And you've got to get that. It's not a speedy cast where you're trying to get a long cast. It's one of those mm -hmm. looping up casts, which is hard for me. Yeah. The yeah hardest it's a part specific about technique. This, yeah. The hardest part about this fishing for seven different species is you got to learn new techniques every time. It's mm -hmm. either streamers, it's top waters, it's mid water. And the lines are what they call a jungle taper in which they've designed it so mm -hmm. that you can throw some pretty heavy, big flies. You know, you're casting 800 times a day and you want that line to be right. Easily get out there. Uh, so real heavy weight forward. Is that, is that the a, difference that you're it's seeing? It's a heavy weight, fo short heavy weight forward. Mm -hmm. And it's a hot, hot weather line. So it won't melt in the heat or disfigure in the heat. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of technicalities and you use a bite wire on the end. Yep. Which is usually about a 30 to 40 pound bite wire, about 18 inches. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a 40 to 60 pound leader section. Okay. Because these are strong fish and yep. they got lots of teeth. <laughs> And they have lots of obstacles in the water, too, to get you tangled up in and rubbed on and whatnot. Other in things. certain areas, there's a lot of structure. Yeah. Yeah. And you wind up, honestly, you land one in five. And I'd say that's a good day. Okay. So it's it's not like they're easy fishing. Uh, they're strong. They're powerful. Once they take it, they're they'll yank it right out. So you have to do a strip yeah. set. It's all in a strip set. Yep. Like a tarpon or a when, own fish. Yeah, yeah, like saltwater fishing, really. I mean, exactly. in a lot of ways. Exactly, except it's saltwater sight fishing. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> now, when you're, when you're fishing like that and you go out, John, are you typically um, heading out with one species in mind? Or are you the kind of the kind of fishing you were doing? Was it more of okay, we're going to load up you know, these two or three rod types because we're going to be ready for anything, and then you know what we see was what we're going to get. You're pretty much ready for anything. Uh, the guides are really good. Uh, the guides, you go out with a, a fishing buddy. You got one guide, and you got two native boatmen who are absolutely incredible in terms of their knowledge of the river, their knowledge of the fauna, the wildlife. And they've okay. got these bows that they make and that's their livelihood. They shoot fish in the water. And I tried and I couldn't oh, yeah, even pull, I've the, seen I couldn't that even a little pull bit. the thing yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've they seen never them miss. do that. Yeah. They never yeah. miss. And there's a whole huh. school of these, what they call abalo, which is the sort of a perch-like fish that the olden dorado feed on. And they're milling mm -hmm. around, and these these young boys with their bows, they hit one every time. I mean, <laughs> I was so impressed. But that's the difference between you and I going to a place like this and those people growing up there. Yeah. You know, right. it is in their psyche. It's they're part of the ecosystem. Right. We're we're a visitor to the ecosystem. They're a part of the ecosystem. Which I think as an angler, we need to respect that. We need to respect that we're visitors. Mm -hmm. You know, we're 
a little bit outside the ecosystem, whereas these guys are just, they're a part of it. It's, it's, it's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your favorite species to kind of target while you were there? I think the golden Dorado. I mean, they are so difficult to catch and they're so beautiful. When you finally get them out of the water, they are, in fact, the name is redundant because in Spanish, Dorado means gold. Mm -hmm. So Olden Dorado is kind of redundant, but you look at them and you say, oh yeah, because they are just bright gold. Right. And their their head is really bony. So you got to really have a sharp hook set and yeah. a strip set to get it in there and get it stuck. And they jump like yeah, crazy. Yeah. It's uh it's a dream of mine. In fact, here I'll move my mic. I think uh well there's a GT, but let's see if I can get my camera to change angles here really quick for us. Bada bang, there's a golden Dorado on the wall I had painted for me. Um that's a dream yep. for me to get down there and go target those guys. So I'm looking forward to it. They just look really aggressive and the um the fight to me seems incredible. It's like a take and then it's a pit bull on the end of your line from what it looks like. It's They're almost exactly like a tarpon. Like a tar They're exactly like a tarpon. Okay. In that sense, in, in the sense of they jump like that. They, if there's structure, they go straight for the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can't let them run. You got to pull them out. You got to pull them out of there. And when you were fishing for them, were you fishing for them in moving water and like a river, or were you in more of a larger, slower moving body of water? Uh, that species tends to stay in the river, in the swift, okay. swift rivers. Now the Paku are in pools. Okay. The uh, wolf fish is in the blackwater sloughs, you know, those backwater mm -hmm. things. So it's all different. And I think that's yeah. what's exciting about this kind of fishing. Yeah. You had a, a photo you sent to me that was really cool too. And it was a unique species that I've, I wonder about, um, cause I've heard stories about it and I've, I've listened to podcasters or speakers talk to me about how to fish for them. And that's the Bicuda. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about that one? Well, I wish I knew more. I caught several <laughs> during the last couple of trips. They, have the same niche as a barracuda in the ocean. In other words, they're one of those roving predators. They're mm -hmm. long and thin, like a torpedo. They're voracious. You rarely see them. They just dart out of nowhere and grab your fly. Mm, okay. And again, they jump and they run and they do all kinds of weird things, but they got a long snout, so they've got lots of teeth on the long snout, but they've got a huge paddle tail. It's kind of yeah, I saw the tail was very big. It's yeah. a big paddle tail and it's bright orange and has a black red spot in it. Okay. Almost and like a redfish. I don't know. If that's, I, don't know <laughs> I don't know if that's a decoy for some other predator to think he's yeah. got the head and he's got the tail instead. I don't know, but they're fun fish to catch. But yeah, are their mouths like uh, pike or musky? Are they like a bill? Uh, they're very much like a bill. Shape? Very, very much like a yeah. bill. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Exactly. And they're kind of slimy. They aren't thick scaly. Oh, almost like, like a bonefish in some ways, or very, very small scales, almost like okay. non-existent. So it's a. Sl it's a soft, slimy kind of feel okay. rather than a scaly fish feel. Yeah. What, find all kinds you, of weird things what, in the jungle. <laughs> yeah. For you, what were the differences when you fished in the jungle versus fish in salt water? What were the, the, the notices that you picked up of? Like, ha, huh, this is a little different because I got to do X, Y, Z. Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, there's a lot of similarities 
in terms of the gear you use. You use eight rate wad, eight eight weight rods. Uh, you use a fairly stiff tippet. But what? Uh, I guess it's the opportunity to sneak up on them and sight fish. Uh, mm. And I've not done a lot of red fishing, so I know you can mm -hmm. sight fish redfish, but I, I've not done that. Uh, they're a lot easier to see in this clear water. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to have another podcast on yeah. that one. <laughs> in, in, in saltwater, <laughs> weather is really important, right? You know, I don't have the wind. To make sure I don't have the wind. Or if the sun's not out, you can't see. Um, yeah. Do you run into those two uh, elements as much in the jungle? Or is it there's not as much shaded because of the the flora and whatnot? Yeah, there's not as much wind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know in Patagonia and places like that, and in the salt water, wind is a significant factor. Yeah, there's not wind; it's hotter than hell, um, and it stays that way. The rains are torrential, mm -hmm. uh, but there is shade, which is really nice. You can get out. In fact, every day for lunch, the natives would go shoot a fish and we would barbecue it on the mm -hmm. banks for lunch. And that was a cool sort of a refreshing time. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But you're out there in the hot sun all the time. So I think yeah. there's a lot of similarities except for the wind. Did you get the feeling that um, your trips to the Amazon, the immersion into the local col uh, cultures was a little higher than some of the other trips you've done? Yes, definitely. Because you're, you're uh, kind of captive, right? I mean... You're captive in a place where there is absolutely nothing else. We flew from one of the big cities on the Amazon. We flew five hours in a single-engine plane, landed on a dirt airstrip, then took another five-hour boat ride, and we were in the middle of nowhere. So there's nothing else to do. You are immersed in their culture, and right. they're really... They're really hospitable. They want you to understand the way they do things. Yeah. One thing they do that was really surprising is they chew a cocoa leaves. Yes. Which is, okay. uh, you know, it gives them a serious cocaine buzz. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a part of their spiritual culture as well as their livelihood in terms of the work they do is hard. They don't get enough nutrition, the stimulant of chewing that cocoa leaves kind of keeps them going through the day. And mm -hmm. it's a sign of manhood. It's a part of their spiritual ceremonies. So mm -hmm. it's no wonder that when the cocaine syndicates come in and mm -hmm. force them to grow cocoa leaves, they're not totally resistant. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't quite understand where that extra coke goes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they don't see the uh, downstream effects of, of their growth. They do not see the downstream yeah. effect and the young people dying of overdoses and all of that. It's yeah. it's kind of a part of their culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, being able to... <clears throat> Like you said, grow up in it in a, a part of a culture. It's uh, equivalent to like having a pocket knife, right? As a kid here in the states, you know, you get to a certain age, you get your pocket knife, you learn things about it, you use it in certain circumstances, you don't use it in other circumstances, and you cherish it in some way. Our and, and, I think we're showing our age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a little, I'm a little not bit sure like that. Every kid, it's a pocket knife anymore. Like, oh, they get yeah. an iPhone, but they don't necessarily right, get a pocket right, knife. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, good point. Well, let's do this. Let's talk about um, your tip and wrap up the show here on this travel rod scenario. So you've done quite a few uh, or quite a bit of traveling, and you've, you've, I think, found a liking for travel rods, whereas 
some people maybe don't understand exactly what that means or um, have grown against them because they feel, you know, the other scenario is what I really need. So give, give us a little background there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I talk to anglers about fly rods and they say, oh, yeah, fly rods are good for three, four weight trout rods. And I say, well, what about the other advantages of actual travel with a six or seven piece eight weight rod? Because what I'm finding is that if you go travel internationally, they hardly ever let you carry your rods on. You got to check it. And so you've mm -hmm. got a clothes bag with your boots and your waders and whatever else your kit. But that's usually not big enough to house a four piece, nine, 10 foot rod. So you got to buy a second bag, which is usually a hundred, 150 bucks each way. Yep. Why not use a travel rod where it all fits in one? And the, the standard line is, yeah, but they're fragile. They always break at the, at the joints. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of on a crusade that, hey, I think we ought to challenge that because I've been fishing for the last couple of years. All those, all those big, toothy, strong Africa, uh, Amazon fish I caught, I caught them all on a travel rod. Mm -hmm. Eight weight, either an Orvis or a Winchwood or a Shakespeare. The problem is not many manufacturers are making them. Mm -hmm. Very few manufacturers are making a travel rod anymore. And I think because of the stigma that it's not as not as strong as a normal four piece rod. And I haven't broken one yet. Mm -hmm. And I've caught a lot of big fish on it. So I kind of like to encourage people to rethink that because number one, it'll save them money. It'll save them space when they pack. Uh, they're easy to carry in a boat because they're a lot smaller. You mm -hmm. can break them down very easily. They're really uh, nice to hike with too in that scenario. That absolutely, you, know, you put I them in their do case, a lot of hiking, throw them on their bag. I know not... you guys do, so yeah. that's a real plus. Uh, they they're are easy to hike with. Standing out on the top of your bag and hanging up on everything, you know, hanging up on trees and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess. I'm about to write an article on travel rods and why I think the industry ought to rethink making them because I think it would be a great set of tools for the traveling anger, especially who goes to mm -hmm. places where, because most international carriers won't let you carry your rod on. So no. you got to face that and the extra cost and the lost luggage possibility as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm seeing more and more um, flights where you'll show up and you'll have a rod tube strapped to your bag or something. And they'll say, oh, well, you're only allowed to have so many items. And that's actually two items. Exactly. I've got it twice too, now. Who long? You need for to check our... one of those. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Some places they don't say anything. You know, I've gone down to Mexico or Belize, and it's yeah. just throw your tube up in the thing. It doesn't take any space, no problem. You know, um, yeah, but you never know. But I've definitely <laughs> had the other, and you yeah. don't want to be without it, right? It's terrifying when someone says, "No, you need to check that bag or the rod, one or the other," and you're like, "Oh gosh, what do I do?" Oh <laughs> god, I know it. Um, the only thing about travel rods, which I'd like the industry to sort of think about is most of them are a sort of a medium action. Mm -hmm. And if you're going into the larger fish, I think a stiffer action rod is probably going to be more useful for you for getting those flies out there across the river. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going fighting to, wind, fighting, fighting wind and yeah. everything. So I think they need to think about how do we make a travel rod that's a little bit stiffer and not just a medium action. Yeah. I'm going up to Alaska in July for uh, big rainbows and all of the other salmon species up there. And I'm going to take my travel rod and I'm going to give it a real shot. Yeah. Uh, so Are I you going to be have... in Bristol Bay for that? 
we're going to be in Bristol Bay. We have a course coming up, which I'd like to mention if I can. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're going to be at the Kulik Lodge, which is one of the first fly-out lodges in Crystal Bay. It's an absolutely beautiful lodge. Uh, we're going to be there July 2nd through the 6th, 2024. And it's a combination of a leadership executive retreat and fly fishing. So hmm. again, we're Very going to cool. use the principles of you're in my book as we make discussions on what we've learned from the river, what we've learned from business, what are the challenges facing business leaders these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so we hope to have eight to 10 people and they can be from all walks of life. They can be profit, nonprofit executives, business people, anyone in a leadership responsibility who wants to deepen mm -hmm. their understanding of their own leadership skills and have some of the best fly fishing in the world yeah for a few days so and they can find out about that at flyersleadership.org uh, okay and i can send you that okay great great we'll definitely share that in the notes and whatnot for people if yeah. they want to try to attend that'd be yeah. fantastic well and john I'll... it's been great having you on the show well, it's nice to get reconnected, Christian. It's been a while since we collaborated, and I always, I always enjoyed our conversations. They kind of go in lots of good ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always something to talk about, and I think that's uh, both of our parallel alignments to business and fishing, right? Yeah. We can bounce back and forth fluently. So again, thanks so much for being on the show, John. Um, taught us a lot about the Amazon. It's really neat to hear, especially I think your stories of how it's changed. Um, mm -hmm. It's concerning in a lot of ways, but it's also um, rewarding and that we can get that knowledge and and really kind of see how that could affect us in the future. So um, yeah, I've got a new appreciate book. that perspective for sure. I just want to mention one thing. I got a book coming out about the Amazon, about deforestation. And it'll be okay. out in November. And believe okay. it or not, it's called Desperate Measures, which, ah. which I think which I think is appropriate for what what the Amazon is facing. And it's written through the eyes of a fly fisherman, so it, it might be of interest to your audience as well. Okay, fantastic. We'll get that in the show notes too, and uh, go from there. Again, John, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, enjoy the notes, let us know what we can do to get better, and we'll go from there. Take care.